Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Neil Fall, and he has 30 years of experience in leading software and service organizations. He was, and this is a laundry list of CEO after CEO position. So he was CEO and founder of NTA Group. That was a division of HNC Software. And we're going to talk about it. That's his first retirement. CEO of Manhattan Associates, and that went public. He was CEO at Alt Data, provider of merchandise planning and management software to the grocery industry. Uh, he was also executive vice president at Logfire, which is a cloud based warehouse management software. And finally, CEO of Axis, which is an enterprise serialization, uh, which he's going to explain a little bit more about when we get talking. And he went to Illinois Institute of Technology. Most importantly, he hails from University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, Neil, thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. So, I'm excited to hear some of your big lessons, some of the mistakes you learned on your journey to success. What worked? What didn't work? And I always like to include a fun fact. Fun fact about Neil is he went to cooking school in Italy. And he had another fun fact, um, which was business related. Neil, do you want to tell that story? Oh, you're talking about the the odd thing that happened. Well, um, in in one of my uh, iterations, um, actually, it was uh, at All Data. Um, All Data was a Finnish company uh, that eventually moved its uh, headquarters to Paris, and um, so I was uh, commuting to Paris. But when I first started. Uh, with all data, uh, the CEO of the of the parent company was in uh, Finland, and what I didn't realize was the Finns like to drink a lot. And it's probably because they don't see very much sun in the winter, um, and they let you know when when you call them on Friday afternoon that they're planning on leaving at five o'clock and being drunk for the weekend. It's it's uh, cultural. So this one time, um, this uh, this guy from Finland uh, was out um, uh, on a golfing. Uh, expedition with uh, them when they came back to the hotel and, and uh, they came back in a limousine and they opened the door entirely different dealing with the Germans is entirely different and what I learned from all of that is uh, things things are different in different countries and you really need to understand the culture to be able to deal properly with each one of them um, there was another one uh, dealing with the English with the Brits in that um, they tend to drink a lot also and I made a comment to an integrator that uh, we were sharing a client uh, I was installing software with a client and she who was the partner on the integrator side uh, used to go out with them every Wednesday night and get as they say pissed and um, what I learned from that was that's culturally okay there in the United States it's not okay so it's it's entirely different thing dealing in each country and it's important to uh, to understand the culture to be able to deal effectively yeah and I want to get into some of your your journey but I want to start off early on um, what was a big influence for you growing up, and what was what was your childhood like? I was uh, I, I was very fortunate. I grew up solidly middle class in uh, in Chicago, and um, uh, there was never any question about my going to uh, undergraduate school um, or even graduate school. My parents were very supportive of that. Yeah. Uh, my undergraduate is in uh, electrical engineering, mostly because uh, I had a family member. Who was in who was in engineering, and I fully expected to go to work with him. But what I found out quickly, for me at any rate, was the engineering curriculum was uh, kind of boring. Mm -hmm. So I finished electrical engineering, but I knew pretty much that I didn't want to be an engineer, and I expanded that to get an MBA at Wisconsin. Uh, I had gone to a, a, an all boys undergraduate school, and that was boring also. <laughs> so uh, going to Wisconsin was a was a, a big eye opener in terms of. Uh, Social and cultural events, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of expanding my my uh, my horizons, but also, I started college when I was sixteen. Really? And so by the time I got yes, yeah, so I got to Wisconsin when I was twenty. I fin I graduated undergraduate when I was twenty, and uh, started started graduate school at twenty. And so I was kind of uh, immature. Um, I couldn't even drink. And can you imagine not being able to go on State Street and not being able to drink? So. <laughs> I had I had to use false IDs to get to get around, but uh, it was it was a growing experience and it was wonderful at Wisconsin. So, how did you graduate early from high school? Were you just accelerated um, through you know elementary and high school? 
I skipped I skipped several grades in in elementary school, and I think I finished high school, if I remember correctly, in three and a half years instead of four. Um, So um, I I think that one of the one of the detriments in doing that is that you lose um, confidence. Uh, you can either become very precocious, which wasn't me, mm-hmm. or you lose confidence because everybody else is so much older than you are and, mm-hmm. and they're so much further along in life. Mm-hmm. So I had that to overcome. Yeah. What was Wisconsin like in the 60s then when you were there? Oh, my Oh my God. Uh, well, there was a lot of drinking. There, I think the drug culture was just beginning. In business school, everybody was pretty serious, so mm-hmm. we weren't seeing that. But you have to remember that was also during the Vietnam War, mm. and there were demonstrations going on at all times. And the, the most dramatic uh, demonstration that I remember was at that time, the business school was at the top of the hill. Yeah. Uh, just be. Uh, yes, it was at the top of the hill, and um, we walked out at noon, and there were crosses all the way up and down Bascom Hill. Mm. which was incredible and it was just dead silence nobody was talking and it was because of it was in honor of all of the people who had died at oh, uh, yeah. in Vietnam wow and then in 1969 shortly after i left uh the physics building was bombed and that kind of was the end of it um what what also was different at that point was that uh that uh the the regents of the university of wisconsin were convinced that this was all being caused by out of staters so Wisconsin became kind of inward looking and mm. uh, made it far more difficult for for the and I'm going to put this in quote the New Yorkers mm. and the Chicagoans to uh to come to the school. I don't know how, what's going on right now in those terms. Mm-hmm. Uh but uh but uh they became far more insular and they blamed it on the outsiders. Hmm. So what did you always know you wanted to be a CEO because it seems like you know that's your CEO after CEO after CEO. I think that I was always entrepreneurial, and one of the things that I, one of the one of the lessons that I learned was I probably should have done it earlier in my career. Um, it's very easy to get complacent when you're earning a good salary, and you have a mortgage, or you have a family, or mm-hmm. you have um, responsibilities. And so I've always advised people um, who are younger to to get started on their careers. Uh, much earlier in, in what they want to do, if they know what they want to do, and um, and um, not and try not to get too involved in uh, in uh, um, commitments, financial commitments, because it means that they can't accept as uh, as much risk as they as they probably should. Yeah. Now there are people who are more comfortable with uh, earning a salary, and that's fine. But uh, what I learned from that um, is if you're entrepreneurial, you should go for that first. Now, you may, may remember there was in the, in the business school, there was an entrepreneurial uh, track. And um, I was an advisor and have been an advisor mm-hmm. uh, to people who have been entrepreneurial at Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And that's always been my advice to them. They were concerned, many of them who were finishing uh, undergraduate, uh, graduate school, excuse me, were concerned because their, their, uh, their fellow uh, uh, graduates were taking jobs that were earning a lot of money, right. uh, what, what appeared to be a lot of money. And um, I always told them that they shouldn't be concerned about that because they would far exceed it if they remained entrepreneurial mm-hmm. and they followed what it is that they really wanted to do. Yeah. Because among other things that I've learned in my life is you're never a success at something you don't really want to do. Right. So what was the early days of your career like after, after um, the MBA and after Wisconsin? See, that was a mistake that I made. I went immediately to uh, to work for uh, for Burroughs Corporation, which was which was good. It's, you know, Burroughs is now Unisys, and um, I went immediately to work for uh, for them and uh, started earning a good salary and bought a car and started making commitments, financial commitments, and mm-hmm. and so it took me until I was uh, um, gee, how old was I? I was in my early 40s before I actually started my own business. Had I done, had I been able to do it again, I probably would have. No, wait, mid thirties. I got that. I was off by a decade until my mid thirties, until I started my own business, and and that was really a watershed for me and and uh, frightening. That is a um, tough decision to make. How did you make that transition? It's very hard. Um, I had a vision uh, for what I wanted to do, and I knew that it wasn't working in the place that I was currently working, and I won't name that one for you, mm-hmm. so, so nobody gets embarrassed. But um, but it was something that I really saw I could make a difference, and and I really thought it could it could make it, and that was uh, Neil Thal Associates, and I just I had to do it, and I and I made the leap. 
Mm-hmm. And um, I was working out of my basement at that point. Uh, I would work from 7 o'clock in the morning when I got up until about uh, 10 o'clock at night. And um, one of the things I'd advise you if you want to have a life is don't work out of your house. Mm-hmm. Because there's no, there's no separation. Yeah. What were you working on? Well, um, that was uh, that. That was the, the division of HNC Software. HNC Software provided uh, artificial intelligence, neural networks, um, under underlying uh, technology, but it needed to be used for something. And what they were using it for at the time that I met them was for uh, for um, fraud detection. Mm-hmm. So it'd be like uh, credit card fraud detection, that kind of thing. But I saw it as a way to uh, to uh, forecast consumer demand. And retailers really needed consumer demand so that they could hone their uh, their uh, offerings at, at a consumer level. Mm-hmm. And so HNC liked that and uh, and uh, funded me so that we developed uh, using using neural network technology uh, uh, the the ability to forecast consumer demand. And that that uh, technology actually has gone through several iterations, and it is now in uh, in a piece of software that's currently uh, being owned by, I believe, uh, Oracle. Hmm. And so you said, so at the time, like, what was an example of a company using it? Would companies actually purchase it and use it, or how did it work? Oh, yeah, they would use it. What they would do is it, it took in uh, a variety of different uh, parameters like uh, uh, sales and price and um, uh, holidays, and uh, there would be um, half a dozen or, or a dozen different parameters depending upon the retailer. And the way that they would use it is, um, the, it would it would look at trends and it would it would do a regression analysis and trends. And neural networks tend to learn uh, um, over over time based upon um, uh, based upon these these variables, and uh, effectively create algorithms on the fly uh, to forecast what's going on in the next uh, in this case three to six months. Yeah. Did you, um, through the HNC software, did they help with, with selling it, or how did you get some of your first customers? Well, I knew a lot of people in retail because of, the, uh, because of the prior, my prior experience, mm. which was in consulting in retail mm-hmm. uh, with, a, with a medium-sized consulting firm. And so I, I had identified several retailers um, or manufacturers who, who owned retail outlets uh, that I knew. So it was based upon personal, um, uh, initially it was based upon personal uh, network. And then from there, um, we exhibited at trade shows. We, uh, we went out and did cold calling. We did all the things that you need to do as mm-hmm. a startup. Mm-hmm. You use every, use every uh, attribute that you can to, uh, to make it work. Yeah. And it's tough. It's very tough. But uh, nobody ever said making money was easy. <laughs> so what was a big lesson you learned um, there? Do you tell people the they're starting that, or they have their own company? What should they know? One of the lessons that I learned, um, and it's been true my entire life, is that your network is the most important thing. The people you know, maintaining that network, your integrity, so that when you say something to people, you actually deliver on it. That's really key. That customer service, um, all the stuff that you hear from everybody else, is really true. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that you've got to have the confidence in yourself to know that what you're doing is right. Um, you can ask for advice from anybody that you want to ask, and, and you should. And there should always be people around you who are smarter than you are. But, um, the, but the big advice is uh, have confidence in yourself if you really have a vision for something. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I, that I remember hearing um, at a, at a uh, conference that I went to in um, Amsterdam was and this was a guy from uh, from England and he said that um, the difference between uh, British and U.S. companies entrepreneurs is that in Britain if you start up a business and it fails you consider yourself a failure for the rest of your life in the U.S. It, you can start up and fail and start up and fail and start up and fail till you get it right and it's that's viewed positively and I think that that's really true we're a, we're a very entrepreneurial uh, culture mm-hmm. and um, and uh, no one should be afraid to start up and fail because you always learn from whatever your experiences are mm-hmm and you said that with with this first company you had your first retirement right yeah so how did that work how did it come to that well 
the way that it worked is we all went public. Mm -hmm. We were one of Time's top ten IPOs of I think it was 1996. Wow. And that's the big that's the big difference. So you know you you uh, you decide what do you want to do with the money. And at that point, and I was far too young to retire, and I figured I wanted to go and uh, and travel and do a bunch of things. And after about six months, I realized that was boring. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, I decided to go back to work. So what was next? And what happened was then that was for Manhattan Associates. So what happened there was um, the person who started it, who's a very good guy. Uh, had worked for me at my consulting firm, at the consulting firm. Okay. And he wanted me to come in to do a little, a little bit of stuff because I had a good Rolodex in retail. And um, then I wound up doing more and doing more and doing more, and we wound up growing the company dramatically. Um, so that I think we started, when, I, when we started, we were uh, about 110 people. When I left, we were 1,200 people. Wow. Um, but, you know, at some point after about, and I think I was with them for six years, five or six years, you get kind of bored with it. I, I think uh, that all the world is divided into project people and process people. Mm -hmm. Process people are people who like to, to hone the process but, but do it repetitively and do better at it and do better at it, come in every day and do the same things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not, that's not to the detriment, it's just being honest about who you are. Project people who tend to be consultant types like me, mm -hmm. we tend to like to fix things and once they're running, we want to move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. I see. So sort of like engineering. Engineering you would say is more process and that's probably what your personality wasn't geared towards early on. I think that's true, plus mm. the fact, um, and now I'm going to get myself in trouble, but many engineers are just boring people. And I like to be around people who are energized and, and, uh, and that I learn from. Um, the engineering personality, just I'm not an engineering personality. What did Manhattan Associates do then, so people they can understand? I'm sorry, w would you repeat that? Please? I said, what, what did Manhattan Associates do so people can understand what, what did the company do? Oh, Manhattan Associates is the is the largest, still I believe, largest provider of warehouse management software okay. in in the in the world. And um, um, this fellow who uh, started the company had a vision for it, and um, did very well, obviously did very well at it. Yeah. Um, and um, he he's a really good guy, uh, and we had many really really good people in that company, and we and we grew it. Yeah. Um, the cohesiveness of the of the group, the uh, the candor among the uh, among the uh, people who were there was was wonderful. Yeah. So, Neil, tell me about because that had some explosive growth. What do you think were the main factors that attribute? Obviously, a lot goes into it, but from growing from that, you know, hundred people uh, to twelve hundred people, what were some of the key factors that were implemented that people can kind of use in their entrepreneurial ventures? Well, what's important, I believe, is, is setting up a structure and giving people um, direction, but allowing them to grow and succeed or fail among uh, themselves. So in other words, um, I've, I've been in other companies or been around other companies where the CEO needs to get involved in all of the detail at all times. Mm -hmm. The best thing that a CEO can do is, number one, get the best people around him. Number two, mm -hmm. um, allow them to have the latitude to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, number three, allow them. One, one of the things that, I, that I've learned is that um, uh, if I have good people around me, they may disagree with me on how to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because, number one, there may be, there's more than one way of doing something. Right. Number two, they learn. Number three, if they fail, as long as it doesn't hurt themselves or the client or the company, that's okay too, mm -hmm. because they learn something from it. So I think that giving them the latitude to really accomplish things, but with, with um, accountability. So mm -hmm. if you tell them what you expect and you tell them how you're going to measure them, you should let them just do it. Yeah. And then if they don't do it, then you get somebody to replace them. Yeah. What was the hardest part of being the, the CEO at, of uh, Manhattan Associates? I was not the CEO, I was the COO. Oh, CEO, sorry. And the hardest part was, um, it, it, when, after we went public, um, the, the quarterly reporting, and not the reporting itself, but the fact that we had to make quarterly numbers 
and the mm. quarter was so essential meant that we we needed to sub optimize some decisions because we needed to report to the uh to the investors mm-hmm. I think that privately held companies are much easier to grow than public companies mm. so that 's number one. It has nothing to do with with governmental regulation um, i don 't think governmental regulation ever impeded us um, quite the quite the opposite in some cases it helped because the uh the uh, the customers needed our systems in order to meet governmental regulation but uh, but what um, what did impede us i think is that we needed to continue to turn in uh profits um, we we couldn 't make the kinds of investments that would be longer term and I see that as being a, a problem uh th- almost throughout our society we 've got that that short term mentality mm-hmm. you 're always trying to meet that next quarter that 's it that 's it and if you don 't you get smacked. And the CEO has to be concerned about that because he's reporting to the board and to the uh, investors. Right. So, and then that company, you know, you were saying that went public. So what did you do after that or after you, you said this was sort of your second retirement after this, right? Yeah, well, we went public um, probably, uh, um, let's see, we went public in 97, I think, end of 97. And we went public at 16, and when I left, we were at 73. Oh, wow. So we did pretty well. Yeah, very well. Um, and, and I just wanted to do something different with my life. It was time to, time to do, because I'm a project person. So yeah. that was my second retirement, and I figured I was going to go to the beach and, and do other things. Um, uh, for me, one of, my, one of my failings is that, for me, um, making money is, is the scorecard. So uh, doing other things didn't include necessarily uh, um, charity work. Not that I, not that there's any problem with that. It just wasn't for me. What I wanted to do was get started in something else. So I was on several boards of directors during that period of time, uh-huh. and that was fun. Being on a board of directors is is uh, is uh, uh, wonderful because you can act as a mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, this company in Finland found me, and what they wanted was to that was all data. They wanted to. Um, to uh, start up in the U.S. How did they find you? And how did they find me with a headhunter? Okay. And they interviewed several people, and they liked me because of my background and experience. And I started the company in the U.S. in Atlanta. Um, eventually, uh, because of some corporate uh, machinations, they moved the corporate headquarters to Paris. So at that point, I was commuting to Paris about uh, every other month. Really? And that had oh. yeah, and that that's fun. Um, and I enjoyed that. Um, dealing with the French in business is different from dealing with U.S. people in business. So I learned some things from that. What was different? What was different? Um, I think, at least in this company and the companies that I've dealt with in France, they tend to be a little bit more hierarchical. Mm-hmm. They're they're more they're they're not as the organizations aren't as flat in in their thought process. They're, they're, they're more rigid and more bureaucratic. Mm-hmm. Also, they do tend to take a lot of vacations. Um, I think they tend, to, uh, they tend to live better than we do. Mm-hmm. So you get a sense of the fact that we Americans probably work too many Work hours. way too hard. We do, um, and it's not a matter of efficiency. Some people would say, well, we're not as efficient, and we could be as efficient in eight hours as we are in uh, 10 hours a day, mm-hmm. but uh, that's not it so much, at least from what I've seen. I think that they, they actually, in, in France at least, or in Italy, they just enjoy life more. Yeah. And that seems like a, you know, that seems like a huge undertaking. You know, this, this company is like, okay, you take over the, the US, um, uh, US version of all data. So what do you do first when you come on board and you start it? Well... First, you establish an office. I mean, that's, that's the easy part, finding an office, uh, then finding people who are interested in starting up in a, in a company that, that's effectively a startup, uh, people who are, who are um, entrepreneurial enough to be able to do that. So I, mm-hmm. I brought a few people with me or people who had worked for me that wanted to leave Manhattan at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, but the point is you have to find the strategy for how do you break into, how do you break into a new market like that? And to an extent, it's, it's similar to, to a startup. It is, um, it's the strategy for how do you, how do you, uh, 
how do you gain new customers? Uh, what's the strategy? Which which verticals should you be going after? Because you can't you can't boil the ocean. You can't go after every everything. Right. And um, staying focused. So what did you decide and to do? Where did you decide to focus at that point? Because it's um it's a is a merchandise planning and management software for grocery industry. Is that right? Basically yes. Basically yes. That was it. And um, all data had a lot of a lot of. Um, uh, references in Europe, uh, and so I decided to stay in, in the supermarket industry. One okay. of the reasons they liked me is that I had uh, one of the experiences that we didn't talk about was I was, I was a CIO in a uh, in a food chain a oh. long time ago. Oh wow! So I had so I had retail I had food experience as well, and uh, so they liked that, and I could and I could speak the uh, the, the language of uh, of. Uh, the food industry, so they they, they like that, um, and so we decided to stay in that. We had one or two clients that they had been able to get from um, from uh, their European um, uh, base that they had sold into the U.S. But the but the negative part is um, U.S. companies tend to be, or at least tended at that point to be very xenophobic. Just because a company did business in Europe. Uh, didn't mean that it was able to do business in the United States. Right. That was one one problem. Another one that I ran into that was uh, it was an insidious little problem, or a big problem. Um, I remember when I first went over with a budget the first the first January that I was with the company, and I had hired I had hired my executive assistant from uh, Manhattan, and she was wonderful. And so I had a responsibility to her and to I think one other employee. I went over with my um, with my budget, and we were going down the budget line items, and they were all okay until I got to marketing. And they said to me, "This is the Finnish guy and the French guy." They said to me, "You don't have to spend any money on marketing." And I said, "You expect to break into the United States with no marketing dollars?" And they said, "Yes, because we have the best software, and people will find it." And I said, "I guess you don't understand the U.S. market very well." Mm-hmm. And at that point, I at that point I realized it was going to it was going to be an uphill battle. The mm-hmm. reason I mentioned my executive assistant was I had a responsibility. I couldn't just walk out at that point. Mm-hmm. But if it had just been me, that's probably what I would have done. Uh-huh. That was that was hard. That was a constant battle on marketing dollars. We were very market related, and I and I told them that one of the experiences that they should pay attention to was at that point SAP was growing in the United States, and they were spending a ton of money on marketing. They were everywhere. Mm-hmm. And that's how they and that's how they did it. But we didn't have a ton of money to spend, so we did the best we could. So, I guess how did you um, were you able to kind of persuade them to increase that, or or did you find just other channels to kind of fill the gap? A little of both. I, I, we never spent a lot of money on, on marketing. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the initial sales, at any rate, were done. Uh, through once again through my network mm-hmm. um, and through um, my name and I, I had a name in retail at that point because I'd been in retail for so long. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, at one point, even when I had Neil Fall Associates, it was a funny experience that uh, that I was at a trade show and uh, I was working the booth as I always did, and I was out in the aisle because you you have to go out there and pull people in. Yeah, people. Yeah. And I introduced myself to somebody and I said, "My name is Neil Fall," and he looked at me and he said, "I thought you were a concept." <laughs> it was like I was a human. They thought I was a concept, like General Electric. Or something. Right. So. Uh, well, because when I read, when thing. actually, when I read that your bio NTA group, I just I thought the same thing. Actually. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty funny, um, and you know that once again comes back to network. That network is really important, and um, your name in the industry is really important. And the mistakes that I've made, and there have been a few, fortunately not very many big ones, um, have been in relation to uh, things that I've done. That um, a couple things that we won't mention that uh, that uh, people tend to remember. So I don't do any. I don't do any editing. But what what big mistakes can you share that we should definitely learn from? So we don't do the same thing. And you can leave names you know, or company names out. I, I will leave that yeah. out, but I will tell you that in one case I burned a bridge mm-hmm. that I still regret and there was no way to get back. It was mm-hmm. with a person who I respected and um, I did something that um, I thought would never come back to haunt me and it just bothers me. It's it's not been a detriment to my career, but it always bothers me. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was that. Um, I don't think I've ever 
disappointed a client to the extent that I haven't corrected it. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that one. What was it? What but was the time? Oh, that's yeah, go ahead. These, these, these things always come back to haunt you mm-hmm. your entire career. I remember, it's very funny, when, when, uh, when I was growing up, my mother would say, don't do that because it'll go on your permanent record. And I would laugh because there was no such thing. Well, now there is. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you Google me, you see everything. You see articles that I've written. When, it's very odd when people uh, come in to interview Mm-hmm. And they come in and they start talking to me about an article that I wrote 15 years ago it's that I don't scary. even remember. Kind of scary. They pick, yeah, they pick it up from the internet. Yeah, it's very strange. What I was going to ask Neil was, you know, you mentioned disappointed client, but you could bounce back from that, and that's a good point or a good story. What was a time when you disappointed a client, but you kind of turned it around? Okay. Um, because we're all going to disappoint clients. I mean, we can't be 100% of the time on and, and please them all the time. But the, the real you know, factor is if we can turn it around and bounce back and, and get them you know, back to you know, kind of our, our side of things. In my, in my experience at Manhattan Associates, for example, there were several clients that were not necessarily happy with what, what they got. Mm-hmm. Um, and it may, have been, it may have been the client's fault. It may have been that I had somebody working for me who didn't live up to what he should have done mm-hmm. or she should have done. In which case, you go out to the client, you're honest with them, you tell them exactly what happened, you're transparent, and you say, together, let's figure out how to fix this. And you eat some cost, or all of the cost, mm-hmm. because your reputation is more important. But I remember in one case, um, I was dealing with... Um, <laughs> I will tell you who it was. I'll tell you kind of how, how who it is, and you can figure it out. Okay. It's a large diamond mining company. <laughs> a large diamond mining company. It was a Manhattan Associates project. Okay. And we were running into problems, and it had to do not with the client, but it had to do with the integrator. Okay. And it took me a year to turn that around until the client finally realized that it was the integrator who was blaming us for everything instead of what we were doing. But it took facts. And it took credibility, and it took working with the client, and um, it, it took a long time. But eventually, we turned it around such that the client was happy with what we were doing, um, and it took us eating some cost. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just the, it's the nature of the business. Software is a very tough business. Mm-hmm. I keep saying that in my next life, I'd probably sell hot dogs <laughs> because you can you you can understand hot dogs. Uh, Warren Buffett only only. Invest in companies that he understands. I, I read that somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um, soft software is very is a very tough business. You know, managing software, you don't you don't know everything. Um, you get people who are flinging initials around, and, and the initials change every year. Right. Um, and um, and uh, you have to you have to trust the people who you hire, and sometimes you're disappointed. Yeah. So how do you? Because when you grow companies like that, obviously there's a lot of hiring that goes in what are some key things that people should pay attention to when trying to develop and hire a great team well first of all i think that the this is going to be uh, unusual for me to say this but i think the personality of the person is important Mm -hmm. i would say i would never i would never hire somebody i wouldn't have dinner with Mm -hmm. because those are the kinds of people that my clients are going to see as well. And, they, and, mm-hmm. and uh, if they have a personality that, that works with a client, um, even if they make a mistake, the client can understand and it, it can be corrected. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, that's an important factor. Um, obviously, they have to be technically competent, and you, and you do that by having them interviewed by people who are equally technically competent or mm-hmm. more. And, um, and also you check references uh, uh, Judiciously, mm-hmm. um, and probably what you should be doing is checking references that are that are not given to you, but which you find. And now with all of the uh, social media out there, you can find references even if they haven't been put down on a resume. Right. So all of that's important, and all, and all of the checking, and all of the interviewing, and all of the lunches that you do, and all of that, you can still hire, uh, make a mistake. Mm. The unfortunate part is the higher up in the organization that you go the longer that mistake lasts, even if you eliminate the person. Because they've made decisions that, that last beyond their tenure with your company. I see. So 
So you have to you have to be really careful in hiring, and that's really the key. If you hire the right people, the rest of it becomes easy. Yeah. When was the time that you felt you hired the right person, and something didn't turn out like you thought? Oh, happens all the time. Let's see. Um, okay, here's one. Um, several several companies ago, I hired somebody because I needed somebody to run something. Mm-hmm. And this is going to be another odd one. Um, I needed him to run something. And um, my board was pushing me to make a hire right. for this position. And I, and I just hired somebody. And um, he didn't speak English properly. His grammar was off. And mm-hmm. what I didn't realize was that's an indication of intelligence. And I found that out. He wasn't all that smart. Hmm. One of the an issue that you run into the the hardest ones to hire oddly are salespeople, because if they're any good at all, they can get through an interview process. Right, <laughs> that's true. And you don't find out for months whether, whether they're good or not because they're because they're in many cases they're BS artists, which is the business that they're in. <laughs> right. So, so how do you get through so, that? How do you cut through that? Well, you look for you look for indicators. Number one, you ask them specific issues about um, their their sales goals and did they accomplish them? Um, uh, what's important to them? How do they sell? How do they upsell? How do they get their leads? But also, you look at their tenure and their prior companies. If they've been in, a, in three companies two years each, you know something's wrong. Mm-hmm. And then, if they're a successful salesperson, you have to ask why are they leaving the companies that they're in. Because successful salespeople make a lot of money in the companies that they're in. Why would they consider leaving? Mm-hmm. So that's the conundrum. You don't want an unsuccessful salesperson, but you don't want one. But you're not going to get the really successful ones. So that's that's because they're going to stay. With it. Yeah, that's where the conundrum comes in. So one thing is, you know, so when you went we're at all data, what would you say to someone? You said managing software is really hard, and people out there, you know, they have software companies or software startups. If you're, you know, 30 plus year career, what would you tell people to, they need to know when they're, you know, running a software company? Um, I would say pay attention to quality. Make sure that everything is completely tested to the extent that it can be Mm -hmm. before, before you ever give it to a client. Stay focused on what it is that your product is and what, what it is that your product isn't. Mm-hmm. Like you did um, with the grocery industry, you stayed focused and kind of did one one industry? Yeah, that's it. Um, I get get good people, obviously. Yeah. Um, I, and, and once again, maintain your vision. Um, Steve Jobs did what he did not by asking people what they wanted. He just knew what, what to do. Mm-hmm. What when we were at Alt Data, at what point then did you decide, okay, I need to move on? Well, the company was sold. Okay. All Data was a public company. Um, All Data was a public company um, on the uh, Finnish exchange, and um, the company in the U.S. was doing okay. The company in worldwide was doing okay, but um, uh, Symphony Technologies bought into it and wanted to take it private. And I had a golden parachute, and I decided that was a good time to do it because mm-hmm. I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to be with Symphony at that point. Okay. So it just made sense. There was a watershed um, event. So what do you do next? Do you have a third retirement? It would be the fourth one. Fourth. What do you the do? Fourth one. And what do I do next? I think I think it's my next iteration after after Access, which is going to be quite a while. My next iteration is going to be uh, board work. B O A R D N board work <laughs> and um, and uh, maybe helping with uh, another startup or two. I really enjoy that, um, but I want to have some more free time to myself. How did Axis find you? How did Axis find me? Um, Headhunter. Headhunter. A headhunter, and and I turned them down the first time. Why? And um, well, there were, I I couldn't work out the deal properly. Eventually, we came back and we worked out the deal between us, and um, and I've been here for uh, almost three years. Okay. 
two and a half, two and a half years. So um, it's it's been a good run, good run. So when you come on board as in your CEO of Access, right? Yes. What do you do? What do you do first? Oh, well, first of all, you talk to everybody to try to figure out, number one, what does the company do? What are the strengths and weaknesses? Who are the strengths and weaknesses? Mm -hmm. What is the company missing? What is the strategy? So you listen for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And you listen to the board and what it is that they want you to accomplish. And then you come up with a strategy to accomplish it. You figure out who are the, who are the, where are your weaknesses, where are your strengths, and you go after them. What, was it's, there anything? Basically, that, yeah. in, go ahead. In, in this case, it, you look at it as a um, as a as an opportunity to grow a company, um, and that's what you do. Was there anything that surprised you when you were listening? Um, the relative strength of the product that we have, and the reputation that we had in the industry, was really good, mm-hmm. and yet nobody knew it. So we didn't have we didn't have our uh, I, nobody is a, is a, is a uh, is not really true. It's a hyperbole. Many people didn't know it. Um, right. We were not as we were not well known in the industry. So when we go into clients and we'd say we do the following things, they'd say, "Oh, we didn't know about that." So we you. had to get the word out there. We had to get the word out there. We have very very good people who were kind of insular. Mm hmm. That you find that in in companies that are that are um, started up by an entrepreneur who's no longer here, um, because everybody has relied on the entrepreneur to be the the uh, the outward facing uh, person. It. Yeah. And then when the entrepreneur goes away, they they need they need um, another uh, outward facing person. But that's not how you grow a company because that limits your size. Right. Neil, obviously you've had a very successful career and continue to. What's been a painful moment in business? Oh, it's always when somebody disappoints you. You know, there's a there's a, a feeling out there among people who are not CEOs that the CEO is in total in total control. And what you find out when you're a CEO is you're not. You're totally well, you are somewhat dependent upon the people who work for you. And when they disappoint you, that's the worst experience. Mm-hmm. When they do something that, that is disappointing, um, that's the worst experience. Um, uh, followed very closely by when you have to fire somebody. Yeah. And when you fire somebody, it's because they're not doing their job or, God forbid, they've done something uh, uh, detrimental to the company. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, an, I'll tell you a, uh, a story about that in a minute. Yeah. But... Um, but uh, um, that's the worst. Um, I have had many sleepless nights thinking about the next day I have to go out and fire somebody who I like. Yeah. Because remember, it would always be somebody who I would go out to dinner with. Right. But, uh, but I have to be concerned about the company as a whole and the people who remain here. You know, it, it weighs very heavily on me and on many of us CEOs that we have all of these people and all of these families and all these mortgages that we are ultimately responsible for. Right. And, and that's, a, that's a big load. So at any rate, I'll tell you this, this old story. This goes back way, way back. Um, I was with a consulting firm in New York, the name of which you would recognize. It's a large consulting firm. Okay. Uh, early in my career, and we were doing work on the uh, New York financial crisis. That's how long ago it was, when New York was in bankruptcy. Yeah. And, um, and there was this guy who was working for me who had a, he had a, a law degree and a, a CPA. Brilliant, very bright guy. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, I remember I was I was not a partner at the time, and I was out in, in, a, in a client meeting with a partner, and he got a phone call, and he turned bright, he turned white. I'd never seen anything like it, and uh, he said, "We've got to leave right now, uh, and we have to get back on a plane and go back to New York." And I said, "What what happened?" Well, it turned out that this guy, this this brilliant lawyer slash CPA, number one, embezzled money from the city. Whoa. Number two was never a CPA or a lawyer, and our company just hadn't checked the references. So wow. the whole thing was a lie, and, and we, had, we had a lot of backpedaling to do. Um, and I think he eventually, I don't know that he ever went to jail for it, but that's the kind of level of, that's the worst disappointment I've ever experienced. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. It's very, it was very extreme. It was ridiculous. 
Um, fortunately, I've never had that happen again. But frequently, uh, uh, a, a person who you who you expect to do certain things doesn't do it, mm-hmm. or they disappoint a client, and you hear about it sur- uh, circuitously. And th- that's, I think, the worst thing. I think that the best part about being a CEO is working with the people that you work with, and to some extent, the worst part is when they mm-hmm. disappoint you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a crazy story. Um, and Neil, you know, obviously you're a mentor to a lot of startups, people. Who are some of your mentors and the best advice they've given you through the years? Um, oh, that's a good one. Um, my mentors have been my peers. And the best advice they've ever given me is to, is to maintain um, uh, uh, integrity and honesty and, and uh, transparency and, um, and uh, client relationships. Um, my favorite thing is being a mentor. Um, to, to the great extent, being at a board of directors is being a mentor. But, uh, but um, I still have people who worked for me 10 years ago calling me hmm. and, and asking for advice, and that's the best thing. And um, um, uh, one, of, one of the people who worked for me and with me uh, wrote a book, and she put my name in the book. As being a person who she respects and admires, she put a pair. I think there was a whole um, uh, chapter on me. It was amazing. Wow. I don't think of myself that's that way. That's very flattering. It's very flattering. I don't think of myself that way. People quote things that I said 10 years ago that kind of shocked me. Like what, uh, are some things, yeah, what are some things that people quoted you on that, that shocked you? I, I really can't. I can't think of them yeah. right now. I don't remember these things. Yeah. Because they they just um, um, but but one of the things that that my that executive assistant put on my desk at one point she put a she put a sign on my desk that said Mr. Thaw will never have a career in diplomacy. <laughs> Why? Why? <did laughs> because you say, I tend to, What was an example? I'm very direct. Yeah. I'm very direct. I'm very direct. When I, I at, at one point, <laughs> somebody advised me how to end a phone conversation because I used to finish the conversation. I say, okay, well, goodbye. And I'd hang up, and that would be the end of the conversation. It was not meant as anything. So now, to end a conversation, the only thing I know how to say is, um, well, I'll let you go now. What's, so wrong, with, what's wrong with goodbye, though? Because I don't say, well, we've kind of finished the conversation. I'd get uh-huh. done with it, and I'd say, okay, goodbye. Uh, and you just hang up. And, and people yeah. would think I was hanging up on them, which I wasn't. I tend to be a little abrupt. Do you feel like you that's your personality? Do you feel like that's... It's like that because you've had to run companies. You sort of have to be abrupt in a way. No, I think it's. I think it's just me. Mm-hmm. I don't think you have to be abrupt when you're running companies. Mm-hmm. But sometimes, um, you know, people will catch me. And they'll be in my office and they'll be talking and talking about whatever, and I, and I will say to them, "I think this conversation is done." <laughs> That's pretty abrupt. I'm it's glad you haven't abrupt. said that yet in this conversation. No, I'm kind of enjoying the conversation, although I really don't like talking about myself, but you kind of got me in an odd time. But, but um, yeah, you know, sometimes people will reiterate. Uh, yesterday I said to somebody, you know, you said that before. So Being repetitive. You're wasting my, yeah. I didn't say it, but basically what I'm saying was you're wasting my time and right. yours because you've said this before. Mm-hmm. I don't, yeah, well, I don't think that's such a bad thing necessarily. Um, maybe how we put it so we don't hurt someone's feelings, but you know, it's you're sensitive to that probably because you're so busy. And that kind of brings me to my next question, which is, what are some of your daily rituals that you find most important to get so much done? Um, schedule to do list, um, scheduling time with people, trying not. To- to, to allow them to interrupt what you're doing by just walking into your office and starting to talk. Mm-hmm. That's difficult because you don't want to preclude conversation. Mm-hmm. I, tend not to, I tend not to schmooze a lot uh, about personal stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, if I can be faulted, it's I become friends with some of the people who work for me. Um, but I, I, try to, I try to really limit that um, because then it becomes difficult to, uh, to manage. Um, that's a, that's a, a pitfall I've seen some people fall into becoming friends with the people they manage. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think my my timing and efficiency is is okay, 
But what I tend to do is, uh, once again, trust that the people who I've asked to do things, in fact, mm-hmm. do them. Um, I, I don't like following up on people to make sure they did what I asked them to do. You just tell them once and you expect this thing to get done type of thing. Yeah, and, and you're disappointed when it's not. When it's not right. So what's a daily ritual that gives you productivity? Do you wake up early? What, t- what time are you waking up in the morning? Oh, 4.30. 4.30. I knew probably. you were going to say waking up you, that you woke up really early. So what do you do at 4:30? Generally, watch the news. Mm-hmm. Um, I take an hour to myself to just figure out the day and have tea. I'm a tea junkie. Mm-hmm. So um, what kind of tea? Uh, uh, all kinds. I'm okay. looking at six different kinds of tea sitting here right now. They all have caffeine in them. Loose or just uh, uh, the tea bag? All of the above. Okay. There's a cinnamon um, tea that's my absolute favorite. I'll have to message you who, on it to try who, it. Who makes it? I don't remember. I'll have to check it and well, send it to you. Well, let me know. Let me know, would you? I haven't yes. seen it in Republic of Tea. I've been ordering from Republic of Tea lately. Yeah, this is amazing. It takes me off but the topic, I did. but I'll send it to you. Okay, and, and uh, you're going to have to cut this out because it's going to be boring for anybody else, but I just bought a Breville electric tea maker, which I thought was ridiculous, and I'm, I love it. Uh, nice. Um, so 4.30, you're working at 4.30, and what time do you go to bed? At 11.30, 12 o'clock, something like that. So you kind of run on five hours of sleep, four and a half hours of sleep, no problem. Basically, yeah, basically that's true. That's true. Maybe the caffeine helps. Um <laughs> I partially wake uh, partially the reason I wake up at four thirty is my cat wants to get fed and she starts playing with my mustache. Well, yeah, but you can lock the cat out if you wanted to. No, I can't actually. The way that my apartment's set up, the kitty litter, oh. she can't. If if I lock the door, she doesn't get to the kitty litter either, so that wouldn't work so well. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, so I, um, uh, but I tend to like to get up early anyway um, because it's quiet and I can actually get some stuff done. I normally. Um, Go through all my emails around five o'clock, five thirty in the morning, mm-hmm. so that when I get into the office, things are cleaned up, so that I can actually get started. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the unfortunate things uh, that uh, has happened, uh, not unfortunate really, is uh, is uh, I tend to text and email at that time of the morning, mm-hmm. and sometimes people think they have to answer me at that time of the morning, which they don't have to do, mm. or they th- or they feel that uh, I gotcha. that um, if I if I do a lot of emails on Sunday nights that they feel like the business starts on Sunday night. That's just my schedule. It doesn't have to be theirs. Right. Yeah. So I've had to have that conversation with people to tell them that that wasn't uh, important. I, a long time ago, I, a, uh, when, I was a, when I was at Deloitte in New, in New York, uh, we had a partner who liked to do all of his business on Sunday nights, and he would, he would um, uh, call people on Sunday nights. And at one point, I, I had to tell him that uh, that was inappropriate, that I was... Uh, um, <laughs> You're off. I was in flagrante at the time. I did that. I said, oh, that so that he never did it again. But what he did, his wife got angry with him because he would screw up her Sunday nights as a result. Mm. So what he did was he would schedule with all of us that we should call him on Sunday night so that he could say to his wife, well, all I did was answer the phone. <laughs> Try to get around divorced. the system. Yeah, they're divorced. It still doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. So, Neil, what's some of the, you know, we talked about some of the best advice you've gotten from mentors. What's some of the worst advice you've gotten? You don't have to name names, and, and maybe you thought was good at the time, but it's not. It had to do with a takeover of a, of a company, and um, I, I trusted somebody's advice, and it turned out to be bad. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I trusted the wrong person. And that was probably the worst, the worst advice. What was the advice? Uh, what did to they take tell over you? the company and not talk and not talk to the CEO about oh. it? Oh, or not or not talk to not talk to the current owner. It was a it was a privately held company. Not talk to the current owner, and um, that was a mistake. Mm-hmm. So um, it wasn't above board, and I should have known better. Mm-hmm. In- so, um, but I don't I don't see I don't think about the bad advice that I got because basically I'd probably gotten a lot of bad advice and just not taking it. Mm-hmm. Right. What about, I want to know this because, you know, obviously you mentor companies and one of the companies is Logfire. Um, mm-hmm. 
So what's some of the advice you've given Logfire that's helped them? Well, Logfire was a startup. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a somebody, once again, who worked for me, actually worked for me twice. He worked for me once at Manhattan Associates and once at, uh, at All Data. Very good guy. Um, the advice that I've given him, and I don't know that he's taken it, is that he's got to let go of uh, some of the decision process and let other people make decisions. Mm-hmm. Because he was a startup entrepreneur who had to be involved in every detail. Right. My advice to him was, and, and remains to everybody, every CEO, figure out what you're good at, what you really want to do, mm-hmm. and hire the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Don't try to do everything. Because you can't grow that way. Right. In his case, the best thing that he could do was sell. He's a great salesperson and very credible with clients. You should sell and, and let somebody else do the operations. Well, I haven't been around Logfire in a while, so I hope that he's taken that advice. Yeah. Uh, once again, a very good, a very good guy and a, and a good concept. Yeah. And Neil, I appreciate your time. Obviously, you're very busy. I have one last question for you. But before I ask it, I want you to tell us what you're working on now. What is what does your sixth retirement look like? What's next? Oh, boy. My sixth retirement. Well, we'll start. What, what are you working like, on now? What's, what's top of mind now for you? Uh, top of mind now is the strategy for the company over the next three to four years. Mm-hmm. What products, how should our products evolve? What should we be doing versus what should we not be doing? Right. Um, that's top of mind right now. Okay. Um, that's where I'm spending my time. And uh, what's my next iteration? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not great at planning out the next 10 years, if I have 10 years. Uh, I, I, the next iteration is I'm going to Venice for, for a week. That's the next thing. And do some cooking. <laughs> yeah, do a little cooking. But uh, Venice in the next, in the next uh, month, I'm going for, for a week just taking off. I'm very bad at taking vacations, so I kind of forced myself to do it. That's good. You need one. Um, yeah. So my last question, Neil, is this, you know, for obviously for startup entrepreneurs or people of a business, at what point do you suggest they bring on a CEO, like a high level CEO to get them to the next level? You know, because they're always balancing. Like you said, you have to hire. They're probably balancing just, you know, getting sales or budgeting, let alone bringing on, a, you know, an ex- executive to get them to the next level. At what point do you do you do that? When you're sure that the company is on the right track in terms of your vision Mm -hmm. and you need to expand, but you have, but you're honest with yourself about your abilities to actually expand it yourself, to actually grow the business. Mm -hmm. That's when you bring on a, that's when you bring on a, an executive. But I got to tell you, it's very dangerous because you remember that I said that the higher up you go in the organization, the more danger it is, is in hiring because that person um, has more of an effect on the entire organization, whether they're there or whether they, if they, they get fired. Whatever they decided uh, remains for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a very dangerous thing to do. It's a very dangerous time when you're, when you're growing, but you have to be realistic about the fact that if, you are not a, if, you, if you're not an executive to the extent, uh, most entrepreneurs aren't. If you're not an executive to the extent that you that you um, uh, can uh, can actually grow the company and, and let go of some of the decisions, then you have to bring somebody on. Mm-hmm. I'm in a, in a group right now with a group of CEOs, and, and there's a CEO like that right now, and she's terrific. She's running a wonderful company, but she's she's not ready to let go, and so the mm-hmm. company is stifled. Mm-hmm. What is the difference? Yeah, obviously, was, go ahead. I, she would say that uh, she was she was out for six months. She was doing something for six months. And it's personal, and during that six month period, the company grew without her. But she still wants to come back in because it wasn't exactly the way that she would have done it. Mm-hmm. So I've been trying to trying to work with her on the fact that uh, that's okay, and maybe it wouldn't grow exactly the way that you wanted it to, but it's growing. Yeah, that's a good sign. I mean, that she's doing something right if she put the right people in place, right? Exactly. Exactly right. What would you say this different skill, obviously it's a different skill set to be, to start the company and then to actually, you know, be the CEO and run it. What have you found that the skill set people need to be an effective CEO? Oh, 
Um, yeah, because a lot of these entrepreneurs, a lot of the entrepreneurs, like you said, like Logfire, you know, they start their company and they're everything at first. And then when they grow it and they grow a team, then they become, they have a little bit different, um, you know, job, essentially. Now you're more CEO running things as opposed to trying to do everything as a, you know, entrepreneur. You have to be able to communicate what you expect well, you have to have, communicate the strategy of the company, be able to communicate what it is that you expect from everybody, and then learn how to let go. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you do that? How do you learn how to let go, especially with someone who's, uh, you know, people who are high level probably tend to be more controlling? You hire a board of advisors, or you put in a board of advisors or a board of directors, and you listen to them. You have, you have mentors around you mm-hmm. that can see things. I don't know any other way to do it yeah. unless you are unless you're good at management, which is very possible and, and many good people good at management are not necessarily entrepreneurs right um, uh, unless you're really good at management, um, you have to be realistic about it, otherwise your company won't grow right so who do you I know we talked about your mentors who sticks out to you as I know you said your peers <laughs> who what peer, uh, you know you've asked me the last question a few times what what peer <laughs> you can't get me off the line. <laughs> You're just going to have to say this conversation is over. No, Yeah, that, pretty soon I'm going to say, well, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll send you a bag of, of tea uh, for your time, so don't worry. I'm, I'm just going to send, send you the, me, the send cinnamon me the name tea. Of, send me the name of the tea company. Tell me the name of the tea company. I will. I want to know okay. a, a peer of yours and what they said, like specifically. A peer of mine and yeah, what they said about what? That you, like, someone you consider a mentor. That's been impactful. Someone, someone individually. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not going to name names. Oh. But I figured, like someone who a, you would you would have write the forward of your book or something like that. Who wouldn't mind you naming their name? You don't have to. Obviously. Oh. No, I'm not going to name names. Uh. Uh-uh. Okay. This one I'm not going to. This one I'm not going to answer. I've been forthcoming about every other one, but uh, there's some people who I would consider to be that way, for uh, at various times for various reasons yeah. that I've really enjoyed working with in business. But if I would say honestly, mm-hmm. I haven't had a mentor, and I should have had a mentor a long time ago. I think I would have done more and better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Neil, I appreciate your time and uh, sharing all your expertise with us, and uh, I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure.